Yeah, okay, good. So it's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Larry Zitnick, who's currently a research director at FAIR, Fundamental AI Research at Meta. Um, Larry has his, uh, started out working in robotics, he's got his PhD at uh, CMU in robotics, and then um, went into computer vision and worked on uh, detecting you know, fraudulent images, photo DNA technology, uh, worked on acquisition, fast acquisition for MRI imaging, and uh, a number of other things. And then more recently, he has moved on to uh, new, uh, new territory, working on um, basically the use of AI and machine learning in chemistry. And in particular, he's going to be talking today about new catalysts for renewable energy uh, relating to trying to address the climate crisis. So welcome, Larry. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to assume that most of you people uh, are not chemists. Uh, you're probably a machine learning background or maybe computer vision or you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and I, I get the question a lot, like, why are you working on chemistry now? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off today just giving a little bit of motivation for why, why is chemistry an interesting problem? You know, why is it something that we should be working on? Uh, no insult to any of the chemists out there. Uh, and then describe from an ML perspective why looking at this problem is actually interesting. Because a lot of times when you look at a new problem, it makes you look at the ML models that you're so familiar with in a new way. And I think there's advancements that we're making or ways that we're looking at machine learning much, that's much different than we look at it when we're looking at it from computer vision or large language models. And it's just really intriguing. And hopefully I can share some of the insights that we've had in looking at the chemistry problem and why that's interesting from a machine learning perspective. And then towards the end, what I'm going to get to more is some of the practical aspects, like how do we um, you know, are we going to be able to see this actually have real-world impact? You know, what are the, the remaining barriers and that sort of thing? All right. So to start off, let me just, I want to talk about this science paper. It, this science paper, they, they make a lot of predictions. They're, they're saying things that are fairly, um, let's say, controversial. And in that paper, they state, many statements you may think are of an alarmist order. Certainly they are depressing but they are founded on stubborn facts. And this paper goes on to say, all civilized nations stand in deadly peril. Right? This is you know, it's a pretty you know, strong language. And I think it resonates a lot with, I think, the way that we feel sometimes when we look at some of the world problems today, especially climate change, um, you know, drug discovery, that sort of thing. But the amazing thing about this paper is it wasn't written now. This paper was actually written in 1898. So what were they so concerned about in 1898? Well, what they were worried about was not having enough to eat. They were worried, are we producing soil is totally unequal to the strain put upon it. See, what they were worried about is back then, the, uh, they were heavily dependent upon wheat. And wheat is a fertilizer-intensive crop. So the world population was going up. And they were worried about getting enough fertilizer. And where did they get their fertilizer from? What was the best fertilizer of the day? Water. Exactly, bird poo. And they, and, and where do you get bird poo? You mine it from islands along the ocean. And as humans are, you wouldn't be surprised, they mined it till there was none left. And they knew the end was coming. And they didn't have a replacement for it. And they were freaked out, right? So who did they call on to solve this problem? Who was going to come to the rescue? Chemists who make poop. Yes, well, the mining the islands. But yes, it is the chemists who poop a lot, uh, who must come to the rescue of the threatened communities. It is through the laboratory that starvation may be ultimately turned to plenty. So what were they talking about? Well, two chemists, Haber and Bosch, developed a process. They went through thousands of experiments, like literally trying all sorts of different reaction conditions, et cetera. And they were able to find a way to take nitrogen in the air, which is super plentiful, combine that with hydrogen to create ammonia fertilizer. And you're able to find out a way to do this economically at scale. And because of this, we were able to take our world's population from less than 2 billion at the time to nearly 8 billion today. You know, a 
4.8 you know, percent increase in population. And you think about it, like what are the biggest scientific advances we've had in humanity? Like this has got to be one of the biggest ones. To be able to take our population and grow it to that extent and be able to feed everyone, like that is a big deal. And this is because of the chemists that were able to do this. All right. But don't forget genetic engineering too in 1960. <laughs> There's a lot of other good things. But you know, this is a talk about chemistry, so. <laughs> um, Field effect transistors. Yeah, well, of course, none of this work that I'm doing would make any difference no, if it wasn't for transistors. Talk about important inventions. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of times people underestimate the impact of chemistry, you know, and the impact it can have. So that was 1898. Let's fast forward to today. What problems do we care about today? Well, obviously, climate change is one of the biggest ones, right? And if we want to address climate change, we need to be using more renewable energy. The good news is, is that the amount of new renewable energy that we're generating is going up really fast. You know, this is going from 2010 to 2021. You see it's going up really great. Um, bad news is, is that if we want to get to you know, carbon zero by 2050, we need a six excess in the next uh, 25 years or so. Be frank with you guys, six xing something, I'm not actually that worried about. It. I think we could do that. You know, like we've already gone up quite a ways. Like this seems actually vaguely achievable. Um, even like anything within 10x seems like achievable for you know technology and innovation. If that was the end of the story, the problem is is you can't just do that. Which let me describe. So. Let's look at an average day of electricity demand in California. It looks like this, where it kind of is lowest around noon in the day and peaks when everybody comes home and turns on their TVs. Now, if we look at renewable energy generation at the same time, you get this, you know, where obviously you get a peak in solar when it's noon, wind is kind of constant. So let's say we 3x the amount of renewable energy that California is producing. What do you get? You get this. Yeah, there's an obvious problem. At noon, we have way too much electricity. In the evening, when everybody's turning on the TVs, we run out of electricity. So just 6xing the amount of renewable energy we have is not going to solve the problem, because we're going to be basically throwing away almost all of it. What we need to be able to do is figure out a way to take that renewable energy when we can create it, store it in some way, to then use it when we need it. All right, so how do we do that? How do we store that energy? So two things you might think of is batteries, you can also pump water uphill. They're great solutions, but they don't scale incredibly well. There's only so many mountain valleys you can flood. Batteries, you need to buy a new battery for every little unit of energy you want to store, which can get quite, quite cost, cost expensive, or cost, uh, cost prohibitive. And then you could build more transmission lines, but this is just not happening fast enough because you know, government regulatory issues and all of that sort of thing, right? So what are some other ways that we can store renewable energy that's going to scale to like nation size and world size grids? Well, what we need to do is take the surplus energy generation, we need to store it somehow, and then be able to spit it out when we have excess demand. And one way to do that is take electricity, combine it with water, and split it into hydrogen and oxygen. You store the hydrogen, and then later use that hydrogen in a fuel cell to create electricity. Storing hydrogen, super cheap. We can do this at scale, right? Another thing you could do, you could take hydrogen, you could take CO2 out of the air, you could run another chemical process to then make methane. What is methane? Methane is essentially natural gas. We know how to store natural gas in massive quantities. You can then take that natural gas, burn it again, and obviously store the CO2 when you burn it, uh, to create electricity again. And that can serve as a good storage vessel if you want. So why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we using these processes right now? Well, the answer is, is that these processes, these chemical reactions, are too expensive. They're still not cheap enough to compete with just burning natural gas coming right out of the ground. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how to make these processes less expensive, or yeah, less expensive. And the trick to doing this is finding effective catalysts to drive those chemical reactions. Because what makes the chemical reaction cost effective is finding the effective catalyst. And a catalyst is a material used to increase the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. So let me just describe a little bit about what a catalyst is. So we're all on the same page. So here is a car. It's a Toyota Mirai. Um, it's one of the few hydrogen cars you can buy out there um, in the real world right now. It has a fuel cell in it. On the fuel cell is a cathode and anode. And on the cathode there, and the anode, there's a catalyst that's going to interact with an oxygen molecule. So let's look at what happens at that. So here we have a chemical reaction. We have O2 plus some 
uh, hydrogen, and we want to create some water. We have an, the absorbate is like the molecule in the chemical reaction. So if I ever say absorbate today, think molecule in the chemical reaction. And then we have the catalyst. So what's going to happen is that oxygen molecule is going to come down, get attracted to the catalyst. And when it gets attracted to the catalyst, it's going to weaken the bond between the two oxygen atoms. So that way, when the hydrogens come in, they can more easily pull that oxygen atom off and create a water molecule. And now that that one oxygen atom's off, then the bonding even weakens further, and you can pull off the other oxygen as well. So what you're seeing here is that the catalyst is basically weakening the bonds of the molecules, which allows the chemical reaction to run at faster rates, which means you need to add less heat, which means it's more economical, and we can do this at scale. Right? The problem here is with catalysts is you need them to be just right. It's got to be a like Goldilocks. If the catalyst attracts that molecule too strongly, then suddenly the entire surface of the catalyst is covered with molecules, and the whole reaction grinds to a halt. If your catalyst doesn't attract it, just, it, doesn't attract it uh, at all, if it's too weak, then it doesn't have any impact at all. Right? So what you need is a catalyst which is just right, which attracts it just enough that it's going to let things fly back away, but it's strong enough that it can weaken the bonds between those in, in the molecules. It's got to be just right. And the problem is, is that for uh, electrolysis, like hydrogen generation from water uh, and fuel cells, and for many other applications, it's a catalyst that we know that work are platinum, iridium, expensive metals. They're very expensive. And because of that, that's why this whole process is not done at scale today using these methods. So what we need to do is we need to find alternative catalysts. We need to find other materials that don't use expensive metals, uh, et cetera, and that are durable and that can, we can use in these reactions to run in the water. Yep. Isn't the other issue also that storing the hydrogen in the cup requires a high pressure and a big cup? The, uh, it does take additional energy to pressurize the hydrogen. And there are actually other kind of more creative ways of storing hydrogen as well. But that's less of a concern from, uh, from a total cost standpoint than creating the hydrogen in the first place. The other problem right now is most hydrogen that you get today is actually generated through carbon intensive processes. So it's not green hydrogen. It's like you actually use natural gas to create the hydrogen, which you end up like it's not effective you know, in that way. So we need to be able to create this hydrogen without creating carbon uh, in that process. But that is part of the cost overall uh, system. So if you go back to that cycle, like you do have energy loss. You know, when you take renewable energy, you create hydrogen, and you go back to renewable energy, you're not going to get the same amount of renewable energy back because you have, you have to compress the gas. You have to run these processes. But the renewable energy generation is getting cheaper and cheaper as we speak. Like solar panels are getting cheaper. So that part of the equation uh, is likely to become econo ec economically feasible if we can figure out how to make this process work. Cool. So let's talk about how we actually discover a new catalyst. So the way we do this computationally is we would take an absorbate. And absorbate, again, is that molecule in the chemical reaction that you're interested in. You place it near the catalyst surface. And then you compute the forces on the individual atoms. You then update the atom positions, and you repeat. So you get something that looks like this, where you take an absorbate, and kind of the catalyst kind of you know, looks like it's hugging it in this, in this one. But basically, you can see how tightly, bond, how tightly attracted the catalyst is to the uh, surface of the catalyst, or how tightly attracted the absorbate is to the catalyst. And then the energy that results tells you how strongly that attraction is. And you can use that to then predict the reaction rate trends of the overall reaction using that catalyst. All right? Now, to compute the forces and to compute the energies that I just mentioned, we use something called density functional theory. Right? And basically, density functional theory, what it refers to is a density is the electron density. Functional means it's a function of the function of the electron density. And well, theory is a theory. Um, it estimates energies and forces. And it iteratively does this. It's essentially an eigenvalue problem. Uh, the thing to know is it's order n cubed, where n is the number of electrons. Right? The problem with DFT, and the problem would kind of be solved now-ish if DFT was fast. The problem is DFT, if you have 10 atoms, it's going to take minutes. If you have hundreds of atoms, it's hours or days. And if you have 500 atoms or more, it might, it'll take weeks. It might not even converge. So it's computationally incredibly expensive to run DFT. And this is the reason why we don't see DFT used for studying like larger nanoparticles. We don't use DFT to study proteins, that sort of thing, because computationally, it's just too expensive, or it, it, we just we can't fit it in RAM, essentially. 
Now, for catalysis and the problems that we're worried about, really we're only talking 100, you know, 100 to 500 atoms typically in a system, which means that we can do a single relaxation like I just showed in approximately one day of compute. So it's possible, but it's still really expensive, right? So, and then the number of catalysts we want to screen, there's like billions of possibilities. So even though it's possible, it's not feasible to do large scale screening because it's computationally just too expensive. Yeah? Wait, sorry, just as like a rough estimate, is there like, a, like is there a rough estimate for like the runtime of the step with the number of atoms? Like just to get like your statistics? Uh, you know, it, it's going to scale n cubed. Oh, okay. You know, because it's n cubed with the number of electrons. Oh. So, you know, you, like you can study, you can have more hydrogen atoms than you could like platinum atoms. And there's a lot of like asterisks in that because you usually only model the atoms that are in the outside outside shell. You don't model all the atoms, like or, sorry, all the electrons in the outside shell, not all the electrons, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, essentially that's that's the case. But in our systems, a lot of times it is metals. It's like atoms with a lot of electrons in them, and you do have hydrogen as your absorbates a lot of times too. All right. So how can we take this computation down from a day and get it down to a second? How can we do that? You know, who's going to come? Like, how can we do screening at a large scale? Well, this is where ML can come to the rescue, where AI ML researchers can come, obviously, with the help of the chemistry folks, because we won't know what we're doing if we don't have good chemists to you know, help us out and teach us more about chemistry and work with us closely to understand the problem. So in order to study this problem, we started the Open Catalyst project. This is a collaboration between CMU, Meta, and University of Toronto. CMU are our computational chemist partners. University of Toronto, we collaborate really closely with them on the experimental side. And then at Meta, we bring a lot of compute and ML expertise uh, to the problem as well. So if you know me, uh, and if you think about ML, what's the first thing you need to do when you study a new problem? Is you gotta create a data set, right? And this is one of the reasons why we started on this, because we thought that by working with Meta and CMU together, we could create a really good data set. Uh, which had, which was done correctly, but then could have a huge number of training examples. So that we, we could train ML models that could approximate DFT across a broad set of materials. So the data set has 140 million training examples, and this data set took over 500 million hours of compute to generate. Right? This is tens of thousands of servers running for months and months on time, you know, like 24-7 like to generate this data set. And this is one of the reasons why we got into it, because we didn't, if we didn't do this, we felt like nobody else was going to. Because like, to get that much compute is really hard. And not only that, is to use that much compute and be able to open source the data. So that way, the data is there for commercial, non-commercial purposes to basically help the entire community uh, move forward in this problem. Yeah? So how did you create the data set? Was that also through density functional theory? Or? Yeah, so the data set, so what we're trying to do is approximate DFT. So we're using DFT as a ground truth. And uh, this is all run on Facebook servers. So when Facebook servers aren't serving cat videos, like they're running DFT calculations in the background, <laughs> you know, is a way to think about it. We basically get the lowest rung of compute at the company, but there's still so much compute there that we can use that. To, yeah. So when you say 500 million hours, it's 500 million processor hours? Or 500, it depends on the size of the, the server, the server set that you're using. They, this is this is 500 million server hours. Server. If you did this, if you did this, a rough estimate. If you do this on AWS, it's about a dollar per hour. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. This, go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Um, for uh, for like the data set itself, like what would like the the, the y values would correspond to the results of the DFT. Um, what would the x values correspond to? I'll get to that in two seconds. Yeah, no I'm, I'm worried about the fact that DFT is only an approximation. So if you did band gaps, it would be off by a factor of two, which would be really bad. How do you know it's good here? Yes, uh, one of the reasons why we studied this specific problem is we felt that DFT was a close enough approximation that it would work. You know, we're never going to do better than DFT. Like we're training our models on DFT. So if you have a problem where DFT doesn't work, or this level of theory won't work, like the ML models aren't going to do something magical. So you need to have a problem in which you feel like DFT, you know, at least gives you a reasonable representation. I'll get a little bit to that like later on as well, because even here, like mapping the computational results to the experimental, like you'll get trends. You're not going to get exact predictions. Like there's so much else going on. It's a very, you know, this is like scratching the surface type of thing. Um, all right. So your question, inputs. The inputs are essentially the 3D, 3D atom positions and their atomic numbers. That's it. 3D atom positions and atomic numbers. 
the outputs. Oh, and it's, uh, this is a catalysis. It's like uh, a surface. So you can think of it as like whenever I show that, it's actually a unit cell that gets repeated infinitely in x and y directions. So you're creating a surface with an absorbate on it. Um, and then the outputs is a single number, which is the energy of the whole system, and then per atom force, which is a 3D vector. Right? So if you think about this from an ML perspective, that's all you need to know is you have a problem where you have a bunch of 3D points as inputs and the atomic number of the, the atoms. And the output, you just have to predict a 3D vector and a single scalar. That's it. And you can, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I didn't... Oh, shoot. Um, for like the, do you have like some sort of guarantee when you're running it that like the charge of the whole system is neutral or something? Because like they can be super ionized, which like changes that a lot, right? The, you have to make certain assumptions in certain settings that we use you know, for the DFT calculations. So, you know, you have to kind of assume that the ML models are not going to predict, like, the other things that DFT compute. We're just going to be computing this aspect of it, if that's what you're, like, okay. um, referring to. You can get, again, it's dependent upon your specific application, you know, and whether certain, like, there's, there's certain applications this wouldn't work on because DFT isn't going to be appropriate for it, or you're not going to be modeling the right aspects. But again, for this problem, for this specific problem, and for many problems, this is adequate for many, for many problems out there. And as a side note, we have used this for other problems, internal problems that estimate other properties that have nothing to do with energy and forces, and it works great. The same underlying model architecture is just trained with different data. Like, they still work. You know, it's just, uh, yeah. I'm just going to ask that we restrict questions to quick clar clarifying questions for now. The more depth-like questions we can say for the end, so make, that way he can get to the end of his talk before I'm running out of time. <laughs> I like all the you. questions, though. It's fun. Um, all right, well, you'll, we'll pause. OK. Yeah. yeah, feel free to ask questions, though. It's OK. Um, OK, so we're going to model this with a graph neural network. Uh, each node equals an atom. Each edge is a neighbor. Uh, and then the main, thing that you're, the main thing we want to think about is the message. So basically, we have a bunch of node embeddings, and we want to update those node embeddings using a message passing scheme. How do we compute that message? All right, so I'm going to be talking about, now I'm going to dive into some of the ML specifics of this problem and some of the things that I think are quite interesting from an ML perspective in basically uh, calculating that message M. All right? Now, one thing is when we compute our outputs, there's two different ways of computing the outputs. So one is we have a model, we initialize it, we do a bunch of message passing, and then we compute the energy. And then we compute the forces by doing a back propagation and computing the forces as the um, derivative of the atom positions with respect to, or the derivative of the energy with respect to the atom positions. All right? And you can do that by back, back, back propagating through the network. You mean atom or absorbed positions? Uh, all the atoms. So basically, you compute the derivative of the energy with respect to all of the atom positions. And that'll give you the, the force for every atom. In the catalyst or of the absorbed position? Oh, both. Both, every, every, every atom, right? Because uh, the, the atoms on the catalyst move too, uh, not just the absorbate. Um, you could do it this way. It has a lot of great properties. The problem is it's computationally really expensive because you have to do the forward pass, backward pass, so that takes twice as long. It takes twice as much RAM, which means your model has to be a quarter of the size as if you didn't do it this way. So we generally, in practice, don't do it this way, at least for this problem. So instead, the way we're doing it is we just have initiate the model, do message passing, and then directly predict the energy and the forces. The negative side of this is that the energy and forces may not be consistent. You know, so if you follow your forces around and you go in a circle, they might not sum up to zero, you know, which is not physical, obviously. But because you can use a bigger model, it's more efficient in practice, this just works out a little bit better. So we use this, this approach. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is equivariance. This is something that's really important in, in this space. Uh, and basically means if an input is transformed, the output should be similarly transformed. So to kind of explain this, let's talk about computer vision, because you guys know I like computer vision. Um, let's say we have a function f, which can segment out dogs from the images. Well, if you're a translation equivariant, it means that if you take that image, you translate it, you run the same function, and you translate it back, you should get the same thing back, as if you just did the, the uh, segmentation directly. right? Um, now, why do we want translation equivariance in computer vision? You know, it's, it's not because of some physical property. Like, that doesn't matter, right? The reason we care about it is we don't have to train a dog detector for that rectangle, and another one for this rectangle, another one for this rectangle, another one for this rectangle. We want the network to learn what a dog is once and be able to apply that equally across the entire image. It's more, like, it's more data efficient 
You know, it's more computationally efficient to have something that is equivariant. Like you'll get better results, it'll be more accurate. That's a reason for it. Um, so the way we do this, as you guys know, is we do, you know, we break it up into a grid and we do a 2D convolution. And you get some output map. So basically applying the same function across the entire image. So taking that learning and how well that worked, one question we asked ourselves a lot was like, what does it mean to do a CNN but with atoms? Like what is the equivalent of that? So let's talk about equivariance again. So what do we care about with atoms? Do we care about translation equivariance? No, because you, you don't even have to worry about that. Um, what we care about is rotation equivariance. So what I mean there is if you take a bunch of atoms, you compute the forces, is if you rotate that system, compute the forces using the same function and rotate it back, you should get the same thing. So the forces should rotate with the system, all right? And one thing that is important when you think about molecules and atoms is like orientation information is super important. So if you have a carbon dioxide molecule, it looks like this, you know, two oxygens, oxygens on either side. It kind of makes intuitive sense that they'd be equally balanced, right? With a water molecule, you think there'd be two hydrogens on either side to make them equally balanced. But, you know, it obviously looks like this, right? So you have to be able to model the angular information to really be able to fully understand what's going on with these molecules. So we have a bunch of planar channels for our 2D image. What are we going to do for our atoms? So here we have, a, you know, we have a, an, um, an atom, and we have a bunch of atoms around it. What is the right representation from a machine learning perspective? Well, what if we do spherical channels? So instead of it being planar, it's going to be on a sphere. So that way you can encode the information that exists in all the different orientations around that atom. So the way we are going to model this problem is that spherical representation instead of the planar representation. All right? The next question you're going to ask then is, how do we represent that sphere? How do we represent that function that is on the sphere? Now, if we did exactly what you do for CNN, you'd say, okay, let's just make a grid. You know, that's what we do for that. You know, why not make a grid? Well, there's a lot of issues with that, and you have to resample, and it's going to get ugly. So another way to represent a function on a sphere is to use something called spherical harmonics. So there, you basically have a set of coefficients, and you have a set of uh, basis functions. And the basis functions look like these. Uh, where you have, they have a certain number of degree in a certain order. The main thing to note here is like the higher the degree, the higher the resolution of the spherical harmonics. Now the cool thing about spherical harmonics is you can take, if you take the coefficients, you multiply them by the basis functions, you can basically create an arbitrary function on the sphere. But what makes them really, really cool is you can take those coefficients, you can multiply them by something called a Wigner D matrix, and you know what you can do? you can take that function and rotate it in an arbitrary rotation. So you can basically perfectly rotate that function that is on the sphere in a lossless manner. So if you discretize a grid, you wouldn't be able to do that. But using this set of basis functions, you can just basically make that whole sphere rotate. And that's a really useful property. So now we have a representation. It's on the sphere. Now, how can we do a convolution on the sphere? So the first thing we need to think about is what convolutions do we actually need to do? So whenever we do message passing, we have two atoms. We have a source node, a source atom, a target atom, source node, target node. And we can create a local reference frame where we take, let's say, the uh, target node, make it 0, 0, 0, and then the target source, whichever one I didn't say, um, we can put that along the y-axis. Right? So we create this local coordinate frame. Now, when we do that, instead of having three degrees of freedom, there's only one remaining degree of freedom, right? Because you have that one remaining degree of freedom, which is along the y-axis. And nothing else can move. So we, when you think about the convolutions that are left, we want to make this, this overall network equivariant to rotations. So we only need to handle a single rotation, because we got rid of two because we created that local reference frame. All right, so we have our two atoms. We have the spherical channels. We can then rotate them by a Wigner D matrix to then align them with the y-axis. So whenever we're doing message passing, we can always assume that they, these two atoms are aligned along the y-axis, right? By rotating by the Wigner D matrix, which is that cool property of the spherical harmonics that we just talked about. Right? And the Wigner D matrix is, you can compute that just from a 3D rotation matrix. So imagine there's a function that goes from 3D rotation matrix to a Wigner D matrix, right? All right, so how do we actually then do the convolution about that one remaining degree of freedom? So in order to do that, let's take a step back and look at the computer vision once again. So what's an alternative way of doing a convolution on images? Well, we could take our image, 
We can then do an FFT, Fast Fourier Transform, to get the image in the Fourier domain. We can do a pointwise product with the filter in the Fourier domain, do an inverse Fourier transform, and get the you know, image out. In this case, it's going to be a blurred image. So basically what this is saying is that a convolution in the spatial domain is the same thing as doing a pointwise product in the Fourier domain. Mm -hmm. right? So that's another way that we can do convolution, exactly equivalent to what we mentioned before and the way it's typically done, but you're doing it in the Fourier domain. Let's go back to our spherical harmonics. So again, we have this problem. All we have to do is do the rotation about the y-axis. And let's look at our spherical harmonics themselves, the basis functions. And if we're doing a rotation about the y-axis, what we want to do is look at them. We want to look at like, how they change as you rotate about the y-axis. right? So the ones in the center, as you rotate about the y-axis, don't change at all. They're constant. If we go one out, they change by a constant times either sine or cosine of theta. You go one more out, it's going to be a constant times sine of 2 theta, or cosine of 2 theta, et cetera. So then if you put this all together, they're going to change basically by a constant times sine of, you know, sine of n times theta and cosine of n times theta, which is essentially a Fourier series, if you guys are familiar with uh, Fourier series. This is a 1D Fourier series. So we basically already have, by using spherical harmonics, our representation is already in the Fourier domain. Which means, again, we can just do our convolution by doing a pointwise product between our spherical harmonic representation and the filter we want to use. This makes it super efficient. Right? And this is, just, this is like the, the, the reasoning behind why um, using spherical harmonics specifically is really great for doing convolutions when we're using these kind of atomic systems. So just to kind of fill everything else out, that's, our, that's how we do convolutions. We still have to do nonlinearities, because um, that's what makes neural networks neural networks. Is the way we do that, we have a spherical channel. We project it to a 2D grid. We perform a point-wise nonlinearity on every point on the 2D grid. And then we project it back to a spherical channel. It's kind of clunky, to be honest with you. I don't really like it, uh, but it works. That's what we use. So putting it all together, you can't have everything perfect. It's a good research topic. You can figure out a cleaner way to do it, it'd be awesome. So putting this all together, how do we actually do the message passing? So we have a function f, which is going to be a message passing function. We have the uh, input channels for the, the source, xs, and the target, xt. We have the distance between the atoms, dt, or d, and then the atomic numbers, which are z's. Uh, the first thing we do is we do that rotation. d here is a Wigner d matrices, so you rotate the, the functions and you rotate them back at the end. Uh, or the, the, the embeddings, you rotate them and rotate them back. We have our edge embedding, which encodes the atomic number and distance information. We feed that into the convolution that I just mentioned. We do the nonlinearity, I mentioned as well, and that's it. That's the message passing. All right, that's our network. So how does this work? So uh, this is uh, res the results from 2017 to 2022. The method, uh, method I just described uh, was came out in 2023, and it performs a bit better. One thing to note is it's still not performing as well as we want. We want to get it down to uh, 0.2. So this is predicting the energy after doing a relaxation uh, that I mentioned before. We take an absorb rate, you put it on the absorb rate surface, and you predict what the relaxed energy is going to be. Right? So we're making good progress. Still not where we wanted to be. Still a lot of good research to be done. Just to give you some visualizations, this is on the left here are the optimization step for DFT and the machine learning approach. Note that the machine learning is going to be doing this in seconds, where the DFT approach is going to take hours. So it's just optimization steps, but the ML method is much faster. And you'll notice that the relaxation performs nearly identically to DFT. Uh, it converges a little bit faster, uh, but and it ends up in the, almost in nearly the same state. Another example, uh, this one, uh, it finds the, the ESCN, the ML model, actually finds a slightly lower energy minimum. And this happens, you have a lot of saddle points and that sort of thing, so it's not that unlikely for one approach or the other to find a slightly lower energy minimum if you have a little bit of noise in the system. And then here is just an example where it failed. Uh, so the right now, ESCN, the little hydrogen atom is going to fly away from the rest of the, uh, the molecule. And that's called a, a disassociation, and you don't want that to happen. Where in DFT, they stick together. So this is, doesn't always work. All right, so by using this approach, we can take an initial state and we can compute the relaxed structure. We can 
take a different initial state, put the absorber rate in a different location, find a relaxed structure, put it in another position, find a relaxed structure. And what we really care about when we think about a practical problem is not each individual relaxation, but it's the minimum energy across all of them. Because wherever that absorbate can sit on the surface of that catalyst with a minimum energy is this place that is most likely to exist in practice, in the real world. And that's the one that we care about. So the way we can find this global minimum energy is we can perform, let's say, 100 different ML relaxations where you just kind of randomly place the absorbate on top of the catalyst, perform a relaxation. We find the one that has the lowest energy as predicted by the machine learning model. This one here, let's say. And then we can just run DFT on just that one final relaxed structure to refine the energy. All right? So we're just using DFT once. So instead of using DFT hundreds of times to do the relaxations and all these, we just do it once. Or top K, how many you want to pick. And by doing this, you can get a pipeline which is 700 to 1,000 times faster than using DFT by itself. Like, this is like taking things that would take days and getting it down to minutes. Right? So it's a lot faster, but is it accurate? Because you know, it doesn't really matter if it's faster if it's not accurate, right? So let's look at that. So here what we have is a force MEE. So these, this is like the, how accurate the force prediction is according to the, our, our different data sets. And success on the y-axis, which is how likely are you to be within a tight threshold of the um, absorption energy, that, that minimum energy that we were talking about compared to DFT. If we take some of the earlier models, you get results like this. You know, like it's really rare that it would be successful. Look at the next generation of models. They got slightly better, but still not that good. You take the latest generation of the models, the ones in the last year or so, and you're up there. What's really interesting I found in this is that, like, the force is improved. They weren't sure if like the force is improving a little bit and how big of a practical impact is that going to have. But what we see is like the force has improved more and more. That's having even a greater impact on like the downstream applications, at least in this case. <coughs> so we're near. 90 <coughs> 90% of the time, we're getting the same answer, just as equally good answer as what you get with using DFT. Are they all using DFT or just for using DFT? Uh, so this is all, yeah, these are all using, these are all using ML to find, in this case, the five, uh, as predicted by the ML model, the five um, lowest energy uh, relaxed structures. And then you take those five ML relaxed structures and you run DFT, just single point DFT, on each of the structures, and then whatever is the lowest of that is your answer, right? Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's how. All right, and we are actually running, on this problem, we're running a competition at NeurIPS this year. Uh, it's closing next Friday, so it's a little late to maybe start right now, but you know, if you're you know, itching, like, it's still a week left to uh, compete in the competition. Uh, and then also, this service, ah, oh, the video can't be loaded. Yeah, it's all right. It's all, I'll describe it. The, uh, so we're also, for this, is this, uh, we put this out as a service. So people can basically pick out a, um, a, a surface, they can pick out an absorbate, and it's all on, online in an interface. You can go there and it will compute the, um, the absorption energy, the global minimum energy for you, and give you all the other uh, relaxation results as well. So, and we're basically running the GPUs on the back end for the community. And the hope here is if we want to make these capabilities, these technologies, as accessible to the overall chemistry community as much as possible. So not everybody has GPUs lying around. Not everybody knows how to use GitHub or, you know, knows how to use ML code that well. So by putting this out there so people can kind of just kick the tires on it, we're hoping to kind of open it up to a, a broader portion of the community and also get feedback from the chemistry community about how useful this is. And we get to watch it too and see, like, see where it fails and you know, where it succeeds and help improve our models as well. All right. So I just talked about how we can analyze a single surface, like a single uh, material computationally. And the story so far has been pretty clean. Right? Like, and it looks like ML models are doing great. You know, like, it's, it, like, it almost might feel like the problem is close to being solved. But let's actually now put on our like, hey, practical hats and let's say we actually want to discover a new material uh, and find new materials for catalysis. What do we have to do then? Well, first thing you do is you have to pick out which material you want to use. 
so you have a material here, but when you do catalysis, you not like you don't just have a material. You have to pick out which surface you want, right? So you can slice the material you know, in the front. You could use the side of the material. You could slice the material this way. You can slice the material that way, or you could slice the same material but in here, or you can slice it back there. So for most materials, there's you know probably 90 different ways of slicing it. The other thing is, like for most chemical reactions, it's not a single absorbate. There's actually multiple absorbates, multiple intermediates that you care about in that chemical reaction. So you're not just going to look at a single absorbate. You're going to be looking at you know five or even more. And for each one of those absorbates, you then, like I talked about before, you want to place them at many different places on the catalyst to find the, the place of the energy minimum, right? So putting this all together, how many relaxations do we actually need to perform just to evaluate a single material? Well, we have 90 different slices of that material. We have five different absorbates, and we have 100 different placements, which means we need to perform 45,000 relaxations to analyze a single material. Now, if we did that using just CPUs running DFT, the traditional way, it's going to take 120 years, which is why nobody ever does that, like in a brute force way. If you did this, though, with the absorber ML approach, which I just mentioned, which uses you know, machine learning, you can do this with ML plus DFT in just uh, 2.5 GPU days plus 70 CPU days. That might still seem like a lot of compute, and yes, it is still a lot of compute, but what it means is that we can actually start doing it in mass. We can analyze thousands or tens of thousands of materials using this if you have access to a large amount of compute. So the question might be, how many known materials are out there? Now that we can start scanning lots, right? how many you know, materials can we scan? Well. If we go to materials project, there's 150,000-ish materials in the materials project, which are kind of like materials that people, like a lot of them are known that you can create that exist in the wild. Not everybody knows what the materials project. The materials project actually is a, um, a project out of here from Berkeley, uh, which contains like a data set of materials across many different uh, data sets, and it's like a conglomerate of different uh, materials out there, which. Uh, and most of them, I think, are known to be synthesizable or that you can actually create them or have been known to exist in the wild uh, that are out there, and they have basically different properties of them. All right? uh, now, if you look at a specific chemical reaction, though, the number of materials for that specific chemical reaction, which fit the reaction conditions, which means they don't break apart you know, under the reaction conditions, is going to be much less. So the number of stable materials given specific reaction conditions, at least for applications we're worried about, you know, actually go down to maybe 6,000. So the cool part about this is that we can actually scan every single one of those 6,000 and compute the results in every single one of those. The integrative thing is, is like, okay, what do you do after you do the 6,000, right? So, you know, this is where, you know, like, generative AI can come to the rescue. Uh, so instead of making videos or images or whatever you want, like, we should be generating novel new materials. And if you put your machine learning hat on, you're like, this is awesome. I can apply my generic machine learning diffusion models, whatever you want, and just start generating new materials. But this is a practical, it's a real world. It's much more hard, harder than that. Because just because we know that we can make a chocolate cake doesn't mean that we know how to make a chocolate cake. You need the recipe. And if you want to synthesize a new material, it's really hard. Like, you can say what the crystal structure is, but you don't know if you can create it, right? You don't know how to make it. Um, so we need to be able to do that as well. And when you think about you know, a material, like if you think about it from a, an experimentalist standpoint, like they'll say, OK, let's take 20% platinum, 80% copper, <laughs> melt them down, let's stick them together. Like what material is that going to create? It could create all sorts of different crystal structures. And it's not going to be like a single flat surface. It's going to be these nanoparticles most of the time. So which facets are on those nanoparticles? It's not going to be a single one. It's going to be multiple of them. And you know, like a lot of times, if you do that, you don't even create a, a consistent material. It's going to break it up into multiple different phases where you're going to have like a lot more platinum over here and a lot more you know, copper over here. Right? So you ha we have to be able to figure out like, if you run a process, like, what material you're actually going to create. So it's not just a simple generative problem, like saying this material is, has lower energy than other materials near it, so this is one that we're likely to see. It's like, no, we've got to figure out, given a specific process, what material are we actually going to realize? Because all that computational results I just mentioned are going to be meaningless if we don't know what material we're actually measuring. So let's talk about some additional challenges. Can you tell us a little how you use the generative AI to create these? We're just starting. It's a research problem. It's open. We're doing the obvious things first, which is what we generally do, and then we'll go to more sophisticated things. Uh, 
There's all sorts of ways out there. Uh, diffusion models actually look pretty promising for it. The trick is to generate, I don't have time today to go into it, but to generate materials which, um, uh, you're basically looking for a material which has like the certain composition, percentages of different metals, which has the lowest energy. Because that's the material that's most likely to be realized. But just because it is the material that has the lowest energy doesn't necessarily mean that that's the material you're going to generate if you throw it into like your favorite synthesis technique. So it's, it's quite complex in how to do that. It's actually a really interesting problem. Uh, and probably one, we're going to be, it's like one of the biggest problems that we face as a team. It's probably one of the biggest things that we're going to look at next year is the synthesis uh, novel material discovery. Because without that, we're going to run out of materials to actually experimentally or computationally analyze. So, uh, and this is really hard. It's a really hard problem. Uh, it's, it's not like when I say we're going to look at it next year, I don't mean we're going to solve it next year. <laughs> Just to be clear. All right, we're going to look at it. Okay, so what are some challenges? Um, so I talked about you know, absorbing ML where we do the uh, ML relaxation and then we do a DFT at the end. What if we don't use DFT at all? How accurate are we? Well, instead of being at 90%, we are at 16%, which might seem pretty poor, except for uh, three years ago when we started this project. You know what this was? Zero percent. So we went from zero to 16. To me, I was like, wow, like that, like when we first started out, we're like, oh, geez, putting out a data set where the accuracy measurements are zero is not ideal. Um, but getting up to 16 is pretty nice. And then by just doing the DFT call, you know, we're, we're doing much better. So it's becoming practically applicable. The next thing is which one of these relaxations is correct? Which ones of them are wrong? They all look good. Atoms are moving around. They converge to something. It's really hard to tell when the ML models are correct or when they are wrong. Right? We don't have good uncertainty metrics. And if we want people in the field, experimental, computational chemistry, to use these technologies, they need to know when to trust it and when to know it's not going to work. I thought you run brute force DFT to get this answer. You, yeah, you can get verification. from, But even then, um, it fails 10% of the time. Right? Because we're doing a single point DFT. So I guess you will know if you do a single point DFT and the forces come back and their forces are really high, it means you're not at a relaxed state, which means you have to do something further. So you can then, but then if you relax from there, you still don't know if you're hitting the global energy minimum. See what I mean? So like, we need, a lot of times this comes down to, hey, you're doing something that's way too far away from what's in the training data set. You know, like, don't trust it. Um, even though the models do generalize fairly well, for a fairly broad set of materials. If you go too far afield, it's, you know, it's not going to work. But it's an interesting ML problem if you can come up with good uncertainty metrics. Like, it's a great problem to approach it to. The other thing is, like, when we were looking at our models, we had this nice catalyst surface. We had that single absorber sitting on top of it. It's so pretty, so nice, simple. Reality, you know, it looks like, well, this, but worse. You know, you have water molecules, solvents flying around. Uh, you have multiple absorbates. The surface of the catalyst is not perfect. You know, it's much more complex. So, this modeling in the soup, you know, like, this is the real world, or you're not even close to the real world, but more close to the real world, and that's what we're modeling. So there's a lot of approximations being made. This is why I'm saying, like, we're going to be able to predict trends. We're not going to be able to predict exactly the values. The other thing is, if we look at chemical reactions in nature, they happen really quick. If we do DFT simulations, they happen really, really slow. If we do them in experimentally, they happen even slower. With ML, they happen a lot faster. But this is still this big gap. So things that take a long time to like, happen in the real world are going to be really, really hard to model with these atomic simulations. So think about it like, is this material stable? Sometimes you have to run a chemical reaction for hours or days until the material starts degrading. Like, we're not going to be able to do like, like simulations of materials you know, that like, correspond to real world things running for you know, hours or days. Like, it just, you can't do it. So I think we need to think about that. And finally, Really, the biggest missing piece, in my opinion, is to have an experimental data set, experimental results that go along with the computational results that we have. So right now, we're working really closely with the University of Toronto to do as high throughput experimentation as we can. The two challenges of this, one is actually synthesizing a large set of new materials. And the second one is then testing them consistently in a uh, um, repeatable manner. This is one of the uh, PhD students, Ji Hoon, uh, running the chem speed there, doing the testing. So this is something that we're currently working on. Uh, as soon as we get this data and can analyze it, we're going to hopefully release it to the community. And that way, we have experimental results to go along with our computational. And then that way, we can get that virtuous cycle going, where we can keep improving our computational models, 
impact the experimental and keep it refining. Other areas, so one of the things that our team's working on is direct air capture. Uh, running out of time, so it's important. We need to get CO2 out of our air. I don't think I need to convince you guys of that. The way this happens is you take CO2, you have something called a sorbent, which sucks into CO2, and then you just heat it, and then you, the CO2 comes off of it, and you put it into a storage device. The trick is you want it to be attracted to CO2, but not to water or other molecules that might exist in the air. So we need to find, similar to the catalysis problem, we want it to be attracted to CO2, but not attracted to H2O. Is your sorbent a moth, or is it not? It is a moth. Well, we're looking at mostly moths. So there's a new data set coming out in a matter of weeks, knock on wood, uh, that it will be a moth data set similar to OC20 or OC22, but for moths for direct air capture. And it will have CO2, H2O. Um, it will have some uh, uh, defects in the moths as well, uh, so and multiple absorbates as well on the moths. So hopefully that data set will be coming out shortly. Yep. Does it have hydrogen too? No hydrogen. Just CO2 and, uh, and, uh, and, water. and water, yeah. Is it soft? Moth? A metal organic framework. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a, um, has a lot of holes in it, so that way the CO2 can come into it and kind of sucks it up like a sponge. Okay. Some more areas, if you, if you, like, those two areas aren't, you know, important enough for you. There's, like, batteries, there's proteins, there's drug discovery, there's hazardous waste cleanup. There's tons of stuff that we can model if we get these machine learning models and we, get, we can model these atomic uh, 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 processes with computers. It would just be huge. You know, and the way I look at this is it's kind of like a new microscope for us. It allows us to look at what's happening at this, like, like, at this scale in a way that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. You know, if I, it's like, like it is, it's just opening up our eyes, allowing us to see things that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Um, and I think it's really kind of a fundamental scientific technology if we can make this work. And it's a technology that we need to make work in order to solve some of our biggest problems that we have today. So just going back, one final slide, uh, going back to Haber-Bosch. Uh, I said how awesome of a discovery this was, right? But as with everything nowadays, when we talk about it, not every discovery is like purely good. Um, the same process that was used to create ammonia is also great for creating uh, munitions and help prolong World War I. That's how Germany created the munitions during World War I in a lot of ways. And as we know as well, ammonia fertilizers are being overused right now across the world and creating ocean dead zones. So with every new technology, there's great benefits many times, but there's also side effects. So I think when we think about developing these technologies, it's important for us to direct them towards the use cases that we think will be most impactful. And with that, I'll leave it there. This is the team across all different institutions. We are hiring. If anybody's out there looking for a job, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you. Do we have questions now? OK, uh, I'm going to defer to students first. Uh, this is not a student? I give I give pre I give preference for students first. We'll, we'll get to Jennifer's question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh wait, wait, wait for the recording. This is our microphone. Oh. Um, hello. Um, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Um, I'm really curious uh, what, what your thoughts are on if you think any um, new analysis of like quantum properties, because the results you got were like emergent as a result of like a large number of quantum reactions, essentially, from my understanding. Um, so I'm really curious like what you think about how well they could be used to analyze like even on a smaller, smaller scale. It's uh, a good question. My background's not chemistry. So my answer is going to be limited. Uh, one of the things that's important to note uh, with these type of problems is and machine learning models in general is they're data intensive. So you need a lot of training data. And what I've seen is if you try, start modeling things at an even like, lower level, it computationally becomes even more and more expensive. Right? So if you get to a problem where you can't generate adequate training data, I wouldn't really trust ML models to generalize and be good approximations of it. So DFT is just on the cross. Like, you got more expensive at DFT, I think you're, it's not going to happen. But even with DFT, you were talking so much compute to generate that data. You know, that way it's like just barely possible right now. Like, that's why I think this is kind of exciting, too, because the technology, compute power, the ability to do this is just becoming possible today. You know, so this is like the first time in our history that we are able to get to this point, I think. Well, that's really cool. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's give it to Jennifer. I, 
I have very naive questions, and there are two interrelated questions. Somewhere you had a bar that said, this is our goal. Yeah. And I was wondering like where that goal comes from. And then the flip side is, is there any way you can use your machine learning to actually accelerate generation of training data to feed back into the system? Yeah. And, do you ex and do you feel like your data is saturated now? Like what would improve your model at this point? Is it technological innovation on architecture? Is it training data amount or scope or breadth or? Okay, I'll shut up. Yeah, no, I got, I got um, so the first question is where that horizontal line come from at point two. Uh, uh, so that came from DFT is not perfect. It's an approximation itself as well. So there's a certain amount of error in DFT. So if you get lower than that, it's like, you're kind of within the error that we would expect from DFT. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. So I think it would still be good to have it more accurate because then you feel at least you have systematic error versus kind of random error that you get from an ML model. But you know, if you get like much, much higher error than that, and you know, like you're not going to trust it anymore anyway because DFT is not that accurate, right? So you can only get as accurate as that. Second question was like, what's going to advance? New model architecture is everything. Like I think there's a lot of room to be done on that. The papers coming out hopefully, uh, and that subject. And then um, and data wise, yeah, I think the. I think there, there is a good opportunity to sample the space better by using ML models to kind of generate different configurations of atoms and then run DFT on those to make sure that they're good and then feed that back into the training. Uh, we haven't done that as much, mainly because I hate to bias it towards certain ML models. You know, by randomly, like the way we created OC20 and OC22 and OpenDAC is kind of randomly sample things. And that creates a much less biased you know, way of kind of benchmarking the community. But I think as we feel more comfortable in the benchmarking, I think we can try these kind of more active learning type approaches to do that. Uh, and then if we have good uncertainty metrics, then it's even more awesome. Because then we can say, these ones are uncertain. Let's feed them to DFT and, and start that, that process. Over here. Uh, so hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk as well. I would be interested in uh, comparing your field to another field. So. There is also a quantum annealing or quantum annealing, quantum annealing simulators, um, that, from what I know, they also try to go into this direction of material science. Um, if you know, how would you assess like what is going to take a quicker progress, uh, your uh, the ML side or the actual uh, quantum computing side? Uh, so yeah, I'm not a quantum computing expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think definitely in the near term, the ML, I mean, the, the quantum computing is just not there. Like you can't, uh, like the amount of information you need to represent to represent one of these systems is quite large, you know, and to be able to fit that into like a quantum computer nowadays, like you just don't have it. 10 years from now, 50 years from now, obviously that could flip, right? But I think from a near term practical perspective, like what we need to be able to do is like DFT, like if we can make it 10,000 times faster, you know, or 1,000 times faster, that has real practical impact. It allows grad students from studying a single material over two years, and they'd be like, okay, let's try 1,000 materials and do it really quick. Like that's going to expedite research. And for the problems that we're talking about here, we don't got 50 years to wait around for that to get faster, right? So, um, so I think in the near term, this is it. Uh, are we going to be using these ML models in 50 years? Maybe not. You know, maybe uh, maybe it'll be something else, but you know, I think it's the best bet we got for right now. <coughs> we don't have fifty years. No, we don't. Over here. Uh, once you once you predict a relaxation state, can you then use DFT as some sort of reinforcement learning mechanism? So you can kind of have like reinforcement learning from DFT feedback, not RLHF or something like that. It's interesting. I mean, a lot of people study that from an active learning standpoint where you'll do like some, you, you do a part of a relaxation, you run DFT, um, and then you get like the updated values of that, and then you retrain your model using that to kind of fine tune your model and you keep doing that, and that shows improvement. The problem with that is uh, when you think about reinforcement learning, a lot of times you want your reward function to be really fast to compute. DFT is not really fast to compute, so it's really slow, right? And if you look at, like I said, you know, if you look at the running time, and like we're doing all those ML relaxations, right? And we're doing all that computation. We're just doing like one or five DFT calls. And you look at the amount of time spent doing compute, it's still almost all in the CPU DP, DFT calls. It's not the ML models, right? So there's such an imbalance that we want to do everything we can to eliminate as many DFT calls as possible, right? So that's like, like when we think about computational analysis, 
it isn't until recently that we even started considering like the computational cost of the ML models because the uh, DFT calls are so overwhelming. Uh, Ren Scott. Hey, Larry. Hey. Oh, great talk. I was trying to um, see if I got the math right on the screening of the materials project. Uh, I thought that you boiled it down to like there's 6,000 stable materials and it takes, I don't know, about 10 days or something like that to screen it. And it's I, more than 10 days. Huh? Well, 70 CPU, I just average it to yeah. 10 days. I mean, order of magnitude. But it sort of seemed if I got it right that uh, that's like a, like a couple percentage points on the expense of doing the original data set generation. Did I get that right? So the... Um, yeah, the original data set generation was expensive, right? Uh, if you, so, and if you do 6,000 materials, we're actually doing closer to 20,000 materials. Mm. We have some other sources as well. Uh, you're talking uh, a month or so of GPU time on 1,000 GPUs, and... Um, That's a very small, I mean, it's a small fraction yeah, compared a small to the fraction. original. So, the, the, exactly. So, I, so yeah. I guess my question was, oh, yeah. it seems that like you could screen already. It's like a small increment over oh. the original compute. So you might have some candidate materials is where I was going. I was yes. wondering, yeah. you so didn't like, mention... The, the know, good thing is, is now that we're using ML models, is we can actually screen all of those in a computationally <laughs> feasible manner. And that's taking a lot less compute than creating the original OC20 data set. Mm. Now, if we didn't have the OC20 data set, we wouldn't be able to train the models, and we'd never be able to screen that many materials. Yeah. Right? Because then you're talking, it's like infinite amount. Of, you're yeah. talking trillions or yeah. you know, even more compute mm -hmm. uh, hours on CPUs to do that same, the same mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah. Has that yielded any, I mean, I presume that screening is cheap now. Is, uh, the is screening is so relative. If, if you're, should you have some promising it, candidates, or has that yielded something there um, that looks, you know, something to, to go to we, physical experiment and fabrication yet? Or? Yeah, so we are right now working with the University of Toronto, uh, working to perform hundreds of experiments. Um, so what we're working is we have different synthesis partners, and we basically show them a list of materials. Mm. And actually what we want to do now is we're not screening for the best materials that we think are out there from the computational perspective. What we want is a good distribution of materials. What we want to do first is to verify that we can actually predict what we see experimentally. So there we need some materials that don't work, some that do work, and get a good distribution. So that way we can prove that we trust our predictions. Mm. And once we do that, then we go back, we run that same model, which goes from the computational results to the experimental. It's, it's usually simple, like piecewise, linear models, that sort of thing. And then we use that to then predict which materials look most promising. We give those to the experimentalists, uh, and then they run those experiments. So it's kind of, you have to do it in multiple phases to make sure you're staying true. Mm -hmm. What we don't want to do is, you know, uh, rewrite history, if you know what I mean, like in how things are done. So you want to you make sure that you do things in the right order to make sure that we're trusting the results that we're getting. But it's really hard, like going from those, those kind of overly simplified computational absorption energies to experimental results, there's a lot of approximations in there. It's non-trivial. But the more experimental data we have, the more we can fit an ML model to that or a function to that. It gives a better chance of success. Uh, okay, one last. We'll give it to uh, Christian for the last question. <laughs> Okay, you mentioned the other problem that you, in addition to the 6,000 might to want, create more. And then there's a the problem, okay, you sort of put it together and maybe it doesn't crystallize or maybe you don't have the right temperature to crystallize or so. But that seems to me, again, a problem you might study with machine learning, reinforcement learning, something like that. So can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, there definitely, uh, the nice thing is that, the, like, the, the underlying ML problem, you know, which is, you know, given a bunch of atoms, compute the forces and energies, it's actually useful for a lot of different applications. Like I mentioned relaxation, you can do it for molecular dynamics, but you can also use it to help you predict which structures are likely to be stable. Because you can take a structure, you can relax it, say which is energy, you know, rearrange the atoms, relax it, compute the energy, and which energy is lowest is where it's like most likely to be stable. Um, now that is still a very much like uh, an approximation of what's happening in the real world. Because in the real world, you're going to heat those materials up. You're going to have like them flying all over the place. You, you cool them off, maybe heat them up again, cool them off, heat them up again. You know, there's also different ways of creating those materials. So going, like, it, it's, it's actually quite a challenging problem to do everything purely computationally. Like, I'm actually not that confident that we'll be able to, just from a computational aspect, predict what material is going to be generated unless we have a lot of experimental data where we have like a way to generate a lot of materials and then we can basically tra train a machine learning model to then do that prediction. But if we don't have a lot of experimental data, 
which we don't right now, it's really hard to do that just from like first principles or from like the underlying microkinetic models or something like that that might be out there. Um, so that, that's just. Uh, so you probably know Gert and Kristen. Yes. Yeah. No, I talked to Gert last week. Yeah. Gert has this lab where it does yeah. it automatically, so maybe one could generate. Exactly. And it is, it, what's interesting is there's startup companies now, several academic labs, which are getting to the point where we could do high throughput synthesis of new materials. So, you know, I think like in the next several years, I wouldn't be surprised if instead of only being able to generate maybe 100 or maybe 1,000 different materials, we can generate 100,000 materials. If we can generate 100,000 materials and characterize them and know what material is actually generated and what the input parameters were, we have hope that we could actually, you know, come up with a good predictive model uh, if we can get that data. So I think that data generation is a big bottleneck right now in the community, but hope, one that we're hoping to address. You know, uh, not, uh, when I say we, I mean the uh, larger community, we, not just us. That sounds like a good place to stop on a note of hope. Yes. <laughs> and so I'd like to uh, thank, uh, let's thank Larry for a really stimulating and exciting talk. Uh, after this talk, then we'll be able to make some real progress on the uh, world's most uh, challenging problem probably that we have in front of us today. So thanks very much and uh, have a good rest of the evening. Thanks for having me.